Our duty with regard to the Third Noble Truth is not to talk about it too much. It's to realize it, but still to do the duty with the Fourth Noble Truth, the path to the end of suffering. We have to have some motivation. We have to convince ourselves that the path does lead to a good end. It's for this reason that even though the Buddha said that the goal it can't be properly described, and the person attaining the goal can't be properly described, still he would talk about the goal in enough of a way through similes, names, to give us a sense that it is a positive thing. After all, he said, if you have any idea that on attaining the goal you would be disappointed, or there would be any regret at all, that's wrong view. It's totally satisfying. When John Swad made this comment once, that it's so satisfying that you don't even ask who's there, whether you exist or don't exist. The pleasure of the goal. Even though it's not a feeling, it is a pleasure, it is a happiness, it is a bliss. Is that fulfilling? So what are some of the ways the Buddha talks about the goal? One of the epithets he gives for it is anidasana. It's a word that doesn't appear often in the canon. It does appear in two contexts. One, he, the Buddha refers to it, space as being anidasana. In another, he talks about a consciousness that is anidasana. Now, Nibbana is obviously not a space, but the way the Buddha talks about how space is anidasana gives some idea of what the word means. He just says you can't draw pictures or draw words on space because it is anidasana. It doesn't have a surface. Some people translate it as invisible, but you can draw things on invisible things. You can draw things on glass. But if something doesn't have a surface, there's no, no place for things to stick. It's given as an analogy. But the type of goodwill you want to have, the kind of mind you want to have, a mind where things don't stick. So people can say horrible things, but their horrible things don't stick. That makes it easier to be patient with difficult things and have goodwill, even for the people who say those things. As for consciousness, there are two passages where the Buddha talks about Vinyanang and Idasanang. And they're both in the context of what makes the Buddha superior to Brahmas. This is something he knows that they don't know. In one case, he says it's a place where name and form have no footing, are brought to an end. And some people say it's. The Buddha here is referring to the concentration of infinite consciousness and not to Nibbana. But the concentration of infinite consciousness has name. It is it has based on a perception. The perception infinite consciousness. So when he says that there's no name or form, he is talking about Nibbana. It is a type of consciousness, but it's not like the consciousness of the six senses. The consciousness of the six senses, or the five aggregates, covers everything in space and time, near, far, past, present, future. But this is something outside of space and time. That's why it's so hard to talk about. Our language can cover things within space and time, but things outside of space and time really can't be described. As for the other reference, the Buddha says that this consciousness is not known through the six senses. In other words, even when the six senses grow cold, which is the definition of what happens to an arahant at, at death, this consciousness is not affected. Some people say that all consciousness is dependently co-arisen, therefore there cannot be any consciousness outside of space and time. 
But the Buddha himself never said that. There's an interesting passage where a monk claims that consciousness goes from one life to the next. This one consciousness goes from one life to the next. The Buddha asks him, well, which consciousness are you talking about? And the monk says, well, this consciousness that I feel right now. And the Buddha says, didn't I say with regard to dependently co-arisen consciousness that consciousness doesn't doesn't last, that it's impermanent, it's inconstant? Notice he makes that distinction, makes that qualification, dependently origin, originated consciousness doesn't last. It keeps getting replaced by other acts of consciousness, but it itself doesn't last. But the fact that he makes that qualification leaves open the possibility that there could be a consciousness that is not dependently co-arisen. So the idea of consciousness without surface, being outside of space and time, does not conflict with anything else in the canon. And there's an image in the canon that gives you an idea of what it, what it means to be without surface. The Buddha talks about a house with a window on the eastern wall, and the sun rises in the morning. If there's a wall in the west, where does the sunbeam land? The monks answer, well, it's on the western wall. Literally, they say it's established on the western wall. What if there's no western wall? Well, then it lands on the ground. What if there's no ground? It lands on the water. They believe that the earth was supported by water in those days. What if there's no water? It doesn't land. It's not established. There's no surface for it. Think about that, a light beam that has no surface to reflect off of. You can't see it, which is why they say that a, an arhant whose consciousness is not established can't be found. There are two places in the canon where monks die, and Mara is looking for their consciousness. It can't be found because it's not established. It doesn't land anywhere. A light beam of this sort can't be seen by anyone else because there's nothing to reflect it. But that doesn't mean that the light beam doesn't exist. It's like the light beam is going through space. You look up at night and space seems black except for little pinpoints. Those are either sources of light or objects off of which the light is reflected. If there were more objects in space, you would see more reflected light. It's full of light. It's simply that when there's nothing to reflect it, it's not seen. So think of that, a light beam that doesn't reflect off of anything, totally unlimited. This lack of limitations is one of the descriptions both of the goal and of the person who attains the goal. The few times that they try to talk about someone who has gained awakening and has passed away, they use a simile, the simile of the ocean. Just as the ocean is limitless, hard to fathom, the amount of the water can't be measured. That's the person who has gained awakening has passed away. So we're aiming at a state where there are no limitations. As the Buddha said, he dwelled with unrestricted awareness. As he lived in this life, he was aware of things, but these things didn't impinge on him. As he said, he would experience things disjoined from them. Even when he was practicing meditation, he was aware of the body in and of itself, but disjoined from the body. Not in a sense of being alienated, but simply through the fact that he's no longer feeding on these things. When you don't feed on them, they don't come into you. They can have their separate existence. You're not limited by them. So this is the main image to take away, total freedom from limitations. That's the goal we're aiming at. And you can trust that the Buddha would not send you to an annihilation. Or non-existence. 
It's just that because you have no attachments, you can't be described. When you can't be described, you can't be described as existing or non-existing or both or neither or anything else. There's some people who advocate the idea that you're basically nothing after gaining awakening, passing away. Saying that when the Buddha says you can't be described as existing, not existing, both, neither, he's talking about the idea that you exist while you're alive and stop existing when you're no longer alive. But that you're properly described as not existing at any time at all. Well, that would be another way of describing the awakened person after death. And the Buddha says there are no ways of describing that person. When we ask about whether we exist or not, he says, not because it's a trick answer he's trying to give. He refuses to answer because he says the question comes from a wrong state of mind, the wrong state of mind where you're holding on to something, you're holding on to the aggregates, either for fear of losing them or out of the desire to be done with them, but you're holding on. So he has you put those questions aside, but you can rest assured that the, the goal is a good goal, and when you attain it, there will be no regrets. That's the Buddha's promise. And it's the promise of all those who have found the goal. So take heart in your practice. This is a practice going to a good goal. Total freedom, total limitlessness. Let that be your motivation.